today's podcast. My name is Dr. Karen Scott. I will be moderating today's podcast presented to you from the American Physical Therapy Association section on neurology from the Vestibular Rehab Special Interest Group. Today we plan to present two cases of central vestibular and balance dysfunction. These case examples are from a subacute rehab setting. Our goal today is to delineate the similarities and differences while also discussing the prognosis, rehab, and outcome considerations unique to this setting. Joining us today is Dr. Carol Walmsley. Dr. Walmsley comes to us from Good Shepherd Penn Partners in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at Penn Rehab. This is part of the University of Pennsylvania Health System with Good Shepherd as a provider of ther therapy care. Dr. Walmsley has, over, Walmsley has over 25 years of clinical experience in the adult neurological population. She is a board-certified neurological clinical specialist, certified brain injury specialist, and vestibular competency certified. She is also the coordinator for the Stroke Specialty Program at Penn Rehab and co-chair for the Stroke Steering Committee, which participates in coordination of stroke care across the university's continuum. In addition, she will participate in the Neuroscience Service Line Committee, which has oversight at the comprehensive stroke care throughout the University of Pennsylvania's health system. Dr. Walmsley is also a clinical assistant for Arcadia and Temple University. She has been an invited guest lecturer for Penn Rehab Engineering, Drexel University College of Media, Art and Design, and Drexel University's Physical Therapy Program. Dr. Wamsley provides clinical assessment of stroke research sub subjects in the Rehabilitation Robotics Research and Design Lab in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab for the University of Pennsylvania. She received her BS in physical therapy from Temple University and her clinical doctorate from Arcadia University. Despite these numerous things that Dr. Walmsley does, who she is is a movement specialist and enjoys working with complex pa patient cases, which we're going to present this, e this afternoon. So Dr. Walmsley, first I'd like to say thank you very much for being here today. Let's go ahead and um, begin. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Well, we have two fun cases today. First, I'd like to thank the individuals who consented to share their information to assist us today to educate our colleagues. I also want to acknowledge all the other podcast speakers, um, Dr. Neil Shepard, Ann Galgon, panel men member Wendy Webb Schoenwald, just to name a few, for their exceptional talents they have provided to the neurosection vestibular SIG. Um, we have, as you mentioned, we have two cases today. Case one, just briefly, um, will be Mr. B. He's had a lacunar infarct, dyskinesia, and during his course of care, demonstrated BPPV. Our second case, that's Miss M. She's had a medullary infarct as well as a cerebellar infarct and presented with left vestibular hypofunction. Um, what I'll start out with is just reviewing the initial eval of each case. So in case one, that's Mr. B, um, he had been hospitalized with left-sided weakness and aphasia. On his MRI, he had a positive lacunar infarct. Uh, you should know that he is 65 years old, has a history of hypertension, chronic kidney disease, hyperlipidemia, had a CVA three years prior to the current one with chronic dysarthria, his chronic low back pain, lumbar herniation, and spinal stenosis. He's a smoker, has COPD, and from a prior fall has his right wrist fused. Um, Mr. M, just to go over his living situation, he lives alone. This is a first floor apartment and there is no supervision available. He does have step to enter and has some medical equipment at home. 
Um, he's impulsive, distractible, and particularly does not observe his precaution to not drink water. He's restricted from thin liquids. Um, the strength in his lower extremity ranges from four to five out of five. There was no asymmetry in that. Um, balance skills at the time of his evaluation, um, to be able to sit and reach outside midline required contact guard. Any standing um, with or without support required minimal to moderate physical assistance. Um, on his evaluation, he had impaired coordination, impaired motor, motor control, and impaired postural control. Um, in the acute setting, one of the standard outcome measures is the functional independent measure known as the FIM. Um, his scores generally ranged in the 1 to 3 out of 7 as a possible maximum. Uh, gait was limited to 5 feet. Um, he needed moderate assistance with this. Decreased speed and a shuffling gait. Um, he also had a very flexed posture. He tended to stand with his trunk and legs flexed about 45 degrees. And his sensation was intact for light touch and proprioception. I'll share a little bit here about Miss M, case two. Uh, Miss M is a 71-year-old female. She has a history of diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. She had come to the hospital, um, to the acute care setting, with a history of three weeks of imbalance, loss of taste, and uh, a left hearing loss. On exam for diagnostic tests, her MRI showed an acute infarct in the left uh, medulla and the left cerebellum. Um, she had some other testing done, uh, trans. Uh, thoracic esophageal testing. Her MRA was also done, which showed an irregularity of the right vertebral artery. And she was also being treated for urinary tract infection. In her background, she lives in a two-story home with her adult son who works full-time. Her husband is not there all the time because he provides care to another family member who's disabled. She has stairs to enter her home. She enjoys using public transportation, going to places like Atlantic City and senior centers and the theater. She was not using any assistive device. And as can be typical for some of our patients, she also had a fall history. She had two falls in the past six months, one in where she tripped over a rug at her home, and the second fall was due to a hypoglycemic episode. She didn't have any injuries during this time. Ms. N's a very motivated person. She was cognitively intact and pleasant, and her sensation uh, for touch and proprioception was intact. Uh, she did show some impaired coordination on her initial eval uh, and some inaccuracies with finger-to-nose testing. Uh, she had a manual muscle test generally into the four to five range out of five with, again, no asymmetry in her strength of her lower extremities. Um, her functional outcome measures for the FIM ranged in a score of two to four out of a possible seven. Uh, she was able to walk 80 feet, requiring assistance with this, um, showed decreased speed, decreased toe clearance, um, she did have her most significant characteristic was having a left lateral sway. And I think for the evaluating therapist, that was the most significant thing in her findings was that her stationary balance, statically, she tended to sway over to the left. And dynamically, she was able to kind of maintain the midline and not be falling to the left side. I'll go into a little bit of their care, um, maybe starting with case one, Mr. B. He had a long length of stay with us. He was with us for 77 days, and this was due to he did not have supervision in order to go home alone. Um, his first, actually his first 50 days, kind of followed a 
general structured rehab course. Um, he was distractible, so we had to allocate to him time for when he would enter the gym to kind of socialize. He'd have like five minutes at the beginning of the session, five minutes at the end, where he could say hello to staff and other people there, and then he would have to get down to biz business. Um, he would continue to perseverate on wanting water, and when you told him, hey, you can't have water, could I give you something else? His response would be, oh, give me some Mountain Dew. And we'd be like, Mr. B, you can't have Mountain Dew either. That's a thing. Um, his sessions focused on postural control, emphasizing anti-gravity muscles of extension, using doing movements both in isolation and combination. Um, he did have impaired motor planning. So we worked quite a lot on the sit to stand transitions and gait. Um, he required that we give him catch phrases. This was to help synthesize the movements so he could complete the transitions and then be able to repeat them. Um, the verbal phrases we would give him were also so that he could use those phrases himself um, to help his motor and writing reactions. His gait was markedly slow. Um, by day 27, Mr. B's speed was 0 0.038 meters per second. Um, by day 29, we're at 0 0.051 meters per second. He needed to continue to work on strategies um, to kind of keep his attention on that speed and increase that. So for him, um, we developed a racing strategy. This way he could compete against himself, use racing as a method to kind of preset um, himself for the skill. And since he was attending to a racing task and competing against his own racing speed, um, this decreased his distractions and improved his um, motivation. So he continued on this um, course of care through about day 60 with us, um, also working on traditional circuit training, uh, things for endurance and strength. Miss M, she had a much shorter length of stay. Uh, she was only with us for 14 days. Um, we started her care out, um, doing some coordination with her um, within a roll walker, doing such things as turns, dynamic ball toss. Um, she was using fixed gaze strategy to kind of help promote stability with walking. Um, by day five, she was able to tolerate doing some additional things and we were able to do a dynamic gait index. The score for that was a 3 out of 24, knowing that uh, scores below 16 are significantly indicative of an increased risk for falls. Um, we also had a modified Rankin scale on her, which was a 4 out of 6, with the best score being 0 out of 6. And a postural assessment scale for stroke was 30 out of 36, with the best score being 36 out of 36. Um, we were able to incorporate some dual tasking, and we did this in a closed environment. Um, she was really her own advocate. Um, she would always set the bar a little higher at the end of one session for the next session. Um, so one day she was interested, like, you know, can I be able to carry things around in my own room here? So we just used the context of her bedroom um, to have her walk and carry some cold items off her breakfast tray from one area of the room to the other side where she could set up her breakfast table and then proceed to uh, heavier breakfast items and from things that were cold temperatures to warmer um, temperatures. Uh, she also participated in uh, some circuit training involving weights and, uh, and endurance. Um, so you can see in both of these care cases, they sound like very, you know, traditional in working on mobility, working on your balance, strength, 
um, et cetera, as someone might expect in a rehab setting for someone who suffered a stroke. Um, yes. But now their cases start to diverge a little bit. Uh, yes, so Carol, I noticed some some similarities already in in the eval in that both of these cases presented with some risk factors for the stroke pre-diagnosis. Um, both also presented with a relatively with relatively good strength, which I think is an important um, similarity considering where their strokes were located. The other things I jotted down were they both seemingly had balance deficits, primarily in standing and during dynamic tasks with a significantly reduced gait speed. Um, Mr. B, very, very slow, and Mrs. S, also slow, but more in a coordinated type manner. Now, through the course of your rehab, you had mentioned they, they had gone through generally similar similar things. One, one very important thing you mentioned was it seems that your center used patient-centered motivational goals to, spe to the specific tasks, especially with Mr. B to get him engaged in the therapy and keep him focused using the racing treatment you described and using the catchphrases. Mrs. S, your initial rehab focused on the coordination, and I think another important item you mentioned was her patient-centered goals on getting back to her very social life, and you integrated dual tasking for that. So I think those are great similarities in, in the two cases in the initial course of rehab. Now, as you mentioned, they're about to diverge in their rehab. Do you care to comment on that? Mm -hmm. Sure. So let's go back to Mr. B. What starts to happen here in his course of care? Um, we're at about day 60, actually, in his course of care. And he's having a complaint of dizziness with rolling in the bed. And I get the opportunity to observe this early in the morning. Um, he, during bed rolling to the right, he has a 30-second duration of left beating horizontal nystagmus. No history of this, um, no prior um, positional uh, nystagmus going on since the start of his stay with us. We did some positional testing. We tested all canals. and all the canals were negative for any additional BPPB after that time. It was just a one-time observation I saw him when, when rolling in the morning. Um, later that day, he's back at his room afternoon, and his daughter's present. She's now becoming involved in his care. And she calls me into the room because she says, they just walked back from the bathroom. Mr. B went to lie down. And then lying down on his left side, Side, she noticed some incoordinated movement in his eyes and that he had dizziness. Um, so he, he, she couldn't verify if there was any torsion going into the eyes. She just said that they were incoordinated. Um, so what I did at that time was report these two events to, her, to the resident who was on duty, as well as his examination findings during the therapy session in the morning. Um, the next day, Mr. B comes into therapy, and now he's complaining about dizzy and saying, my eyes. Um, he's a big guy. He is six foot three, maybe about 320 pounds, and has a large body habit as to try and move around into positional testing. So I got in a, a second person, and what we did was with two people, did a modified Dick's Hall Pike maneuvers and rolling maneuvers and modified Dick's Hall Pike to the left and left rolling were both negative. Um, we could not, due to his size, kind of get good positioning with the right modified Dick's Hall Pike. But with right rolling, he had left horizontal agiotropic nystagmus, 
this had that crescendo, decrescendo quality, and it was lasting 30 seconds. Um, so this suggested BPPV of the horizontal canal. And what we did with this very large person on a big therapy map was get him to do a barbecue roll, um, which had some challenges because he was not a fast-moving person. His walking speed was slow. Generally, his whole body speed was slow. So myself with another staff person, I demonstrated to the staff person first, and they participated with me in getting Mr. B to do a fast barbecue, to move fast through the barbecue roll um, maneuvers. We followed him up. We retested um, one, two, three days after that. And at that point in time, he was negative for BPPV in all canals, all variants. Um, a CT scan had been done, and that was also negative for any change seemed to resolve, which is having done the barbecue roll, and we could then continue on with the rest of his care through discharge. Um, so kind of atypical that patients don't develop BPPV while they're at therapy. We have had other cases of it, um, but it's not the typical thing you see evolving um, during patients' rehab stay. Uh, Miss M, as she got up and got moving, about day eight, she was able to tolerate um, doing a little bit more of an ocular motor examination. Um, we had some limitations with this. Um, she had glaucoma and was followed by one of the ophthalmologists within the health system. We checked for facial sensation and she was intact on both sides of her face, despite initially um, she did have some complaint of facial loss of sensation. Um, she was not able to hear on the left side, but hearing was intact on the right. Saccades and smooth pursuit were intact. Um, with, with head thrusting to the left, she demonstrated catch-up saccades and was intact to the right. Um, we were wanting to try and assess her dynamic visual acuity but she had severe visual impairments, even with a size 40 optotype um, held at about arm's length. She could just barely make out that image. Um, but it was enough that we could at least introduce some exercise um, for visual acuity and for VOR, um, at least using something size 40 font at arm's length. We were a little bit limited to do an actual dynamic visual acuity test um, to really get a better sense of that impairment. Uh, her BOR cancellation was intact, and she already had a plan coming in because she waited three weeks to get to the hospital when she was experiencing the loss of hearing. She already had a plan to follow up with an ENT for the hearing. Um, so you could see how these two cases then start to become um, very different, even though they may have been admitted under a diagnosis of stroke to the rehab facility. Carol, indeed they are different. They, they seem the same at, the, at first, but I think this demonstrates how the day-to-day -day interaction that your setting affords you can give you that um, patient-specific complaints, for example, in Mr. B, the morning he went in and discovered he had that left-beating nystagmus and then going through your clinical um, testing to determine exactly what it was. I think he demonstrates the importance of listening to the patient and to the family and the importance of the team in the hospital to get a man of his size unbelievably through a roll maneuver, I, I, I applaud you for that, and successfully um, resolving the positional vertigo in one treatment. That, that sounds like a great feat that you undertook. 
<laughs> he actually enjoyed it. <laughs> but he actually laughed through the whole pr procedure. He was laughing more at us because we were having to move him, and he really wasn't contributing. So he was just like, you guys are going to move me, you two little people? And I was like, we we could take care of that. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, that is. Um, I, I just I, I envision a six-foot-seven man doing a barbecue roll in a um, – in the hospital setting, uh, good work, solid job on that, solid job on that. And I think with with um, Mrs. Uh, M, she had a much shorter stay in rehab, and as you mentioned, she had a lot of pre-existing um, comorbidities of ocular health, which affected your initial assessment of her ocular motor control and even her VOR, her dynamic visual acuity and such. Um, but you did kind of modify what what you needed to reach the goal of adapting the VOR and performing her gaze adaptation exercises by simply changing the target font to a size that she could see, which I, I also think is important because um, these patients that we see in the hospital setting or even in an outpatient setting, they have a lot of pre pre-existing medical issues that don't often follow by the book in vestibular rehab or balance rehab. So sometimes as therapists, we need to get creative in, in how we want to achieve the goals uh, for this patient population and, and how, we can, how we can facilitate that. So uh, good, good work on that. Now, the, do the doctors think on case number two on Mrs. S that she had had a she had had a stroke three weeks prior to her hospital admission, and this was the residual effect. Did they offer any timeline for that? I think they were thinking she had it. I believe, actually, in her case, um, she, she had come to an emergency room and presented with her symptoms, and they had done a workup at that time, and she was not showing a stroke. And um, at that department, she said to them, well, you're going to send me home, and if I don't feel better, I'm coming back. And despite that, she didn't come um, from the start of the event, but once she got to the emergency room, um, went, got sent home, found she wasn't improving, and she brought herself back. Very. So it's unfortunate that that took time to evolve um, until that her symptoms were at least clinically pronounced enough, as well as showing up on MRA. Right. Um, but it did take her some time to get into uh, a care right. uh, setting. And I, I, I remember from a, a lecture, I think, in CSM this past year where we were talking about central visual deficits and ocular motor deficits, especially considering strokes of the – where she had her stroke in the brainstem and uh, cerebellum, that a lot of times these don't present acutely on MRI or CT. And oftentimes it's the visual vestibular deficits that will present. Right. So You just had an, inner, an internal sense that something was not right. Um, and it may just not have been clinically pronounced enough, but she she knew herself enough um, and, and went with her own uh, understanding of her body um, to bring herself back in on a, a second visit to the emergency room. Very, very astute of her. Um, thank, thank goodness for that. So mm -hmm. for me, that... That is a prime example of how we really need to listen to what our patients are telling us about their problems. What do they think is going on? And that oftentimes reveals a lot about um, what the true pathology is behind their current symptoms. So a great example of that. Now, what, um, Carol, did you end up doing for their discharge? How did we wrap up these two cases? Oh. Actually, both get to go home. Um, Mr. M, uh, despite that he was with us 77 days, actually got to the point of being supervised in his mobility enough that his daughter could assist him and that she was willing to step up into his care needs um, for this stay. Um, his speed 
improved was at 0 0.083. Um, despite the improvement, he was still below a speed of 0.56, which can indicate a risk for falls. And he actually got to the point of being able, with supervision, to participate in a free water protocol. So I think more importantly to him was the ability that he got to drink water than that he was walking fast. Um, his FIM scores by times of discharge, he was in uh, a FIM of five out of the max score of seven. For Miss M, she also too got to go home. Her dynamic gait index by the time of discharge was a 15 out of 24. Her modified Rankin scale had progressed to a 2 out of 6. Um, the postural assessment scale for stroke um, continued to be a 30 out of 36. And some of the skill areas where she was most challenged were the things involving standing on one leg. Uh, she actually was going to follow up um, with her ophthalmologist for her glaucoma and visual acuity. And the arrangement would be to go to an ENT, not just one for her hearing, but one who could specialize in balance and left vestibular hypofunction and could then go to our balance center um, as an outpatient for more advanced testing after discharge. So it was nice to see both patients both be able to go home. Yes, indeed, especially um Coming, just considering their FIM scores, your initial FIM scores for both of them were very, very low. And while Mr. B had a lot of other uh, issues uh, and a long hospital stay, to get him up to a FIM average of five, especially for his mobility, is, is, is a great discharge back to the community. Mm -hmm. Now, Mrs. M continued therapy in an outpatient setting. And did, did Mr. B... Uh, Miss M was going to actually go home, and as long as we could arrange some transportation for her, um, the plan would be then once the transportation was arranged, she could go to an outpatient setting. Uh, Mr. B, who was more limited with transportation ex um, access, was going to receive home therapy. Great. Do you, in these two cases, what would you say were the biggest barriers to your treatment? I think the biggest concern is that um, having the time to be able to address all of the impairments that are going on and having the length of time. You can see with Mr. B, despite that he had all that time, had he not been with us, the BPPB would have occurred elsewhere. And hopefully, it's, if it had, um, someone in the setting he was at would be able to identify that and be able to treat him as needed. Um, Ms. M, having the experience of being in acute care, um, she was positioned with therapists who were skilled to be able to address all her needs, both the central things that were going on and things that were um, peripheral. So I think the greatest challenge is the therapist having the skills to recognize these things and then being able to just move forward with, with care and not protract care um, if they aren't um, experienced in these different um, areas of therapy. To be able to know the um, central brain components and the peripheral brain components of treating balance, and that quite often in our rehab setting, our cases are complex. We're not getting simple um, cases, so your skills need to be able to match that demand. Yeah, I think that's an important point, is in especially in uh, strokes and mm -hmm. complex central disorders of balance and coordination, we do in fact need to be mindful of all of the sensory integration needed to have good outputs, good balance and good balance outputs, good gait outputs, that it's not just a musculoskeletal issue 
we have to also address visual, somatosensory, motor planning, motor coordination, to, uh, and as well, of course, the vestibular system to get the best outcomes. And even knowing a, a little bit of screening knowledge and then being able to bring that screening to whoever your mentor or uh, clinical expert in your particular hospital might be in visual or vestibular deficits, I think is is a really good point, especially for our maybe newer, newer therapists that aren't as familiar with our these complex cases. So I think those are great points. And I think programmatically we're seeing a shift for our residents in our physical medicine rehabilitation um, program. They actually receive a component of their training on vestibular care and on trying to differentiate um, dizziness or the complaint of dizziness from many patients. And they often will move forward if they don't suspect something um, acute neurological situation is going on. They may instruct the, pa the therapist to say, can you do repositioning testing and rule out that BPPV is not there because it is not an extremely high cost to kind of rule that out if mm -hmm. the patient is willing. And then they can at least say mechanically it's not there, so let's move forward. Right. Um, so the residents are a little bit, you know, are more in tune with that as a component, but there might be other things going on, um, but that would be an easy item to rule out that's not occurring if it's appropriate for a patient to go through that. Um, and our other item is, since we do have a neuroservice um, line, they can more programmatically look at individuals over the continuum of care from the time they hit our front door at the ER all the way through to discharge to home care or if it's to skilled care or something and kind of take a look at the continuum and where can care be delivered mm -hmm. and where is it most effective um, based on what the outcomes are, how could we prevent readmission. So maybe in Mr. B's case, 77 days is a very lengthy stay um, for someone in acute rehab. But through his course here, he was treated for BPPV. We likely prevented him from aspiration pneumonia because without monitoring, he was being impulsive with water. He stayed to the point where he could be on a free water protocol and get discharged to home with a family member. So although it took us 77 days at the cost of rehab facility, we may have prevented um, some readmissions for pneumonia a readmission because he wasn't in a setting with family to supervise. Yeah, most definitely. Right. And with them, on the other hand, we could deliver her care more effectively by sending her home, mm -hmm. seeing that she could then, as an outpatient, we could make those connections like to the ophthalmologist, to the ENT with a balanced component, and afford her um, the follow-up services she needed and could be followed through um, at a cost point that was more effective for her. Right. Well, I think these are both great, great examples of complex cases. Um, taking a complex case and breaking it down to the different components. I also think you made a great point about um, assuring that in developing our neurological residency programs that we uh, allow our programmatic decisions and programmatic uh, programs to address all the different avenues having to do with the neurological system and impairment. So having an individual resident have to work through those vestibular type complaints I think is a great addition. And being able to see the patient move from acute to subacute to um, you know, ER to acute to subacute to rehab to home, even then to outpatient is a great learning experience. So I really, um, and kind of any other last words of summary, Dr. Walmsley? 
Um, no, not at this time, but I thank you for um, asking some questions, and I hope these two cases are helpful to our listeners. Thank you very much. We appreciate you joining us and uh, sharing your area of expertise and your cases with us in the um, podcast community here. I hope everyone enjoys it, and thank you very much. Good day. <laughs>